Mike Barra is the best-selling author of multiple books dealing with UFOs, ancient aliens, and secret societies. He's been a regular guest on Coast to Coast AM, Ancient Aliens, and many other shows. And he's here to discuss today evidence of ancient aliens, how that's been covered up by secret societies, and how that's relevant today with UAPs. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Well, welcome, Mike, to Exopolitics Today. Great to have you here. It's great to be here with you, uh, Dr. Sala. It's, uh, It's a privilege, actually. Well, uh, I know you go back a long way in terms of this uh, UFO issue, and so, and I know you have a background as an aeronautical engineer. So, you want to just kind of like uh, introduce your background to my audience and how you got interested in this whole I- issue? Yeah, you know that's a it's a good question. It's one I always get, but it's you probably get it too. But the truth is, you know, I was I, as a little kid, I was fascinated with space and aliens and moon launches and science fiction and all that stuff. And it's funny because I, um, you know, did Star Trek and Lost in Space get you interested in aliens? And no, I watched those shows because I was like already interested in them. I think I was born that way. And so it's kind of like, you know, I've always had this thing in my background that this was something I wanted to to do and be involved in um, analyzing and studying and hopefully bringing some truth out about it. And uh, I spent my adult years as an aerospace engineer at Boeing. I did structural engineering on basically every airplane they built up until the 777. That was my last project before I left. And, and I've worked for Bombardier Aerospace. I've worked for uh, Northrop Grumman Corporation and uh, did some other consulting gigs and things like that. And then slowly, you know, I began to migrate over to aliens and UFOs because I discovered this guy Richard C. Hoagland that I started watching because I'm so, a bunch of my coworkers at Boeing once at, at a lunch hour were watching a video of his a UN presentation and it was fascinating and I'm like I really like this guy because I feel like his stuff you could prove or disprove you know I naively thought well if we just get good pictures of this we can you know we can uh, actually come to the bottom of it and uh, of course that never really happened and there's been a lot of skullduggery involved with that but it's just something we can discuss later. So, um, you know, by a series of not coincidental events, I got in contact with him and I offered to write him an article for his website when, it, when the internet was just starting and it kind of went from there. And then eventually we, we put a book together and um, Dark Mission is Secret History of NASA in like 2007. And, you know, it was very successful. We had a lot of promotion through Coast to Coast AM and, and uh, ended up uh, sort of starting a career writing and researching stuff about UFOs and ancient artifacts and all the ancient societies, the secret societies that were involved with NASA. And so everything just sort of took off, um, took off from there. And now here I am on Exopolitics Today talking to you. So it's just, it's been a series of, um, you know, basically you just said yes, I said yes to everything and ended up here and it's been a great run. Well, I, I know uh, Richard Holland, Hoagland was really a trendsetter uh, in terms of his books and his lectures, and I remember his Monuments on Mars book, how that was you know, very well received. And then Dark Mission just kind of like really opened things up in terms of what was really going on in NASA. So that was really amazing how he and you, I guess, focused on how all NASA missions used occult days and symbolism. So, you know, wh- why is that? Why was NASA doing this? Well, you know, Michael, the hardest thing to convince people of when it comes to that is that we're not crazy, NASA's crazy, because they did all this stuff. And you look at at the fact that they would they would do things on these ritual dates, these dates that had a lot of significance in ancient calendars and ancient religions. And eventually we sort of sorted through all this and it all came back to a fascination with with the top pantheon of gods of of ancient Egypt. And it it had to do with, uh, eventually Richard figured this out, that they would launch and land and perform certain ceremonies and things um, on the various planets on very specific dates and at very specific times with 
stars and planets in certain alignments over the landing sites. And that we finally figured out that they must have been doing this as a form of religion. And, and it was really fascinating stuff because, because when you look at it, these ancient Egyptian gods, it was all covered in this sort of Greek mythology of Apollo, right? Apollo is not an Egyptian god. He's a Greek god. But then kind of behind that, like if you looked at the the NASA, um, the Apollo logo, the original logo, it had Orion on it. And Orion actually represents Osiris, the Egyptian king. So this is the kind of thing that tipped Richard off and he, and he got digging deeper and deeper into it. And it became almost a joke because we were able to guess when they were going to do certain things based on the stars over a particular place like you know we looked at the stars over Sidonia over the face on Mars about a week before NASA said well we're going to release you know next Thursday we're going to release new pictures of the face on Mars at this time you know or they said on this day right or sometime in the morning of Thursday and we went and looked and you know we used uh, Redshift and other programs and said okay well Orion's belt is going to be exactly 33 degrees above the face on Mars at 1038. So we're going to say the image is going to appear at 1038 and then boom, it would. And, you know, all of this doesn't, you know, people don't want to believe it. They don't want to face the reality of it. But when you look at, you look at NASA, especially the early Apollo program, everybody who was anybody was a member of one of three different secret societies there. The strongest being probably the Freemasons. And most people don't know that Buzz Aldrin took a Masonic apron. That's actually a, that's what we've replaced the American flag with on the cover of Dark Mission. It's, it's actually the Masonic apron that Buzz Aldrin took with him to the moon. And by his own admission and also confirmed by Neil Armstrong, you know, he performed a ceremony on board the lunar module before they ever went out on the first moonwalk. And that ceremony, you know, I mean, really, did he take a ceremonial apron and perform a ceremony, but he didn't wear his Masonic apron? Well, I think, of course, he did. And he also didn't wear his wedding ring. He wore his Masonic signet ring instead of his wedding ring, which may have led to his first divorce. I don't know. But, um, you know, you start looking at this pattern and at some point you just have to say to yourself, well, this is real and, and they're doing it. And then the question becomes why? And I think it is to, to be granted, you know, they're doing these things under the auspices of the gods, at least I think who they think are the real gods, which are Isis, Osiris, and Horus, and Seth. And I, I think that's who kind of NASA worships. And it just comes through in almost everything they do, even right down to, once again, naming the new uh, lunar spacecraft Orion again. This time, they're not even pretending um, to sort of be be slick about this whole Osiris Orion connection, because in the ancient Egyptian stellar religion, Osiris, Osiris and Orion are the same thing. So they're they're coming out and being a lot more overt about it. Yeah. And this, I know this is really a long answer, but you asked me a complicated question. Um, and, and you know, then you look at well, who who picked all the landing sites for the Apollo program? Well, Farouk El Baz, Doctor Farouk El Baz did. He was the head geologist. Well. You know, his father was was an Egyptian diplomat and an expert in guess what? The ancient Egyptian stellar religion that worshipped Isis, Osiris and Horus and Seth. So those connections to me, you know, I, I'm, I think you're like me in the sense that we just we don't discount those connections. They're obvious. They're real. And you just have to accept them no matter how far it might take you down the road on the crazy train. Well, you know, that. Uh, that kind of crazy train or that Freemason train, if you like. I know there have been you know, many people that have described uh, the influence of Freemasons within uh, secret space programs mm -hmm. and uh, within NASA. And, and, and of course, you know, that uh, iconic uh, cover of Dark Mission with the, the Freemason flag or the apron there, I mean, that, that just kind of sums it up. So, um, so, so you would agree then that the, the Freemasons behind the scenes are a very powerful force in running space programs, and they do it because there's a lot of occult symbolism involved in space and places and you know, all aspects of the space programs. So, yeah, you, I, you, you... no, I 100% agree with that. I mean, most people don't know that the head of Project Mercury and Gemini and Apollo 
was Ken Kleinconnect. Well, his father was Seafred Kleinconnect, who was, guess what? The head of the Freemasons in the United States, the Washington DC district, he was the head. So his father was a Freemason. Kenny Kleinconnect was a Freemason. There's the photographs of when Buzz Aldrin brought back that Masonic apron and they're all there, you know, when he presents it at the house of the temple, I think there was a different grand poobah then, but uh, you know, in 1969, but then, you know, so the Fred Klein connect um, eventually took over. And so they were all directly connected with what was going on in NASA. So they were basically running the American space program from the top, right from the very beginning. And then there's other stuff that's fascinating. For instance, you know, I mean, Neil Armstrong was not a Freemason, but most of the astronauts were. And, you know, there might be a reason for this. Maybe these guys all joined the Freemasons because they helped, they felt it would help them get ahead in NASA. People like Alan Shepard and, and Edgar Mitchell, because maybe they felt that they would get ahead if they did that, but it also would have proven to their bosses that they could keep a secret. And if the real purpose of Apollo was to go to the moon and find ancient alien technology and perhaps exploit it and bring it back, then you would want guys that could keep a secret. And, and for the most part, I think all of them have kept that secret um, over time. And of course, there's only a few of the original Apollo astronauts left at this point. So um, you, you can look at it in a sort of a harmless context like that. Or you can look at it and that there was, as in that there was this occult thing going on. I mean, most people don't know that there are no pictures of Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon. None. They're all of Buzz Aldrin. So why did Neil Armstrong go out first? Well, I think he went out first so that he could, you know, photograph the first 32nd degree Scottish Rite Freemason to walk on the surface of the moon. I think that was Neil's job. And that's the only reason he went out first because Buzz, Buzz was there to basically consecrate Tran Tranquility Base as a Masonic temple, which I believe is exactly what it was. I don't know if you're familiar with a book series called Transylvania Sunrise. Uh, it, it uses this character, Radu Cinema. It, it's an eight-volume series, and he describes how there was a discovery in 2003 in Romania uh, under the Bujeji Mountains, and and you know, I mean, a very interesting kind of claim, and which coincides with uh, Romania entering NATO. So there's kind of like circumstantial event uh, uh, things that that kind of support that something pretty major was discovered in Romania where they were fast tracked into NATO. But he says that uh, one of the the first people that kind of like was notified about this discovery and had access through Romanian uh, through the Romanian government was this Italian high level Italian Freemason and he pointed out that this Freemason knew a lot of things that only the Romanian intelligence knew and that he had access and and he kind of like came in and tried to take control of this project that was kind of evolved into a joint American-Romanian um, secret program. So I don't know if you know anything about that particular program, but I thought it was very interesting that the Freemasons were considered uh, you know, to be kind of like a key player in how that project in Romania was run. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that, uh, although it sounds fascinating. And I do have a genetic link to that part of the world. I mean, I'm 50% I'm Hungarian. But uh, it sounds like a fascinating story. And yeah, that's the thing is people try to pass, oh, the Freemasons are just a group of a bunch of old guys who get together and drink beer and tell stories and all that kind of stuff. And it, it really might be that way for most of the, of the you know, the, the blue degree um, Freemasons. But at the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite, at the very top, you've got all kinds of politicians and um economic influencers and you know all basically they try to make all presidents 33rd degree freemasons when they take office and if you're not they sort of run you through the degrees boom 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 in, in a couple hours and make you one and so there is some um there is this hidden power that they have or Maybe it's more of a hidden knowledge that they have. I think that the Freemasons know a lot about human history that the rest of us don't. And you kind of hope 
that they're working us towards the betterment of humanity, but uh, it's hard to see that from where we're sitting right now. So I don't know that story, but it sounds fascinating and it, it's completely believable based on what I know about how NASA operates. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting because it was like uh, you know, the US used radar penetrating technology and mm-hmm. found something interesting under this mountain in Romania and, um, and the, the Freemasons knew all about it. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, they definitely they definitely had an agenda to bring Freemasonry to the moon, and and they did that repeatedly. And I mean, again, you know, with this connection in the book in Dark Mission, one of the things Richard and I did was we connected through other scholarly sources. Like there's a book called The High Room Key, which was written by uh, uh, Lomas and Robert Lomas and another researcher whose name escapes me at the moment. I'm getting up there. But uh, the Hiram Key basically says Freemasonry is the worship of ancient Egyptian religions, Isis, Osiris, and Horus and Seth. And they're represented by these stellar gods, you know, these, um, Sirius and Orion and the ancient Egyptian stellar religion. And th- there's just absolutely no question that all of that um, permeates all the way through NASA at every level. And you even get out to like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which I'm going to be I'm going to be working on um, I'm going to be working on a script for the Y files about Jack Parsons and Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and you know when you look at people like Aleister Crowley, I mean they all believed in these ancient Egyptian gods. So I think it's it's there's a worldwide religion um, that basically thinks that we are descended from these three or four um, ancient Egyptian gods, and it, it's it's bizarre to um, it's bizarre to contemplate, but in in reality, Michael, the evidence is there all around us if we just if we just look at it. You mentioned the, in Dark Mission that there were three groups that were running NASA or, or competed amongst each other for influence, right. and you you've, you mentioned the Freemasons, you mentioned the Egyptian occultists, but the Nazis that they were mm-hmm. a kind of third group. So you want to tell us about the Nazis, Operation Paperclip, and how the, what kind of role they played in in um, NASA. Well, obviously very important because, you know, Werner von Braun himself, who was brought over under, well, I don't think von Braun was paperclip. He was pretty much out in the open. He was their rocket scientist. But guys like Kurt DeBus, who ran um, ran the Johnson Space Center in Florida and others, were brought over under paperclip, which was um, essentially set up to sort of sneak German scientists and engineers into America and get them into the American rocket programs. And, you know, I, I joked once, I said, I think on an Ancient Aliens episode, we didn't have an American rocket program. We had a German rocket program. And if you look at all these guys, uh, they were not supposed to be here because under the executive order that created Paperclip, there weren't supposed to be any ardent Nazis. That was the quote, ardent Nazis. And these guys were all ardent Nazis. Um, in, in fact, von Braun was very close personal friends with Heinrich Himmler, who was the number two guy to Adolf Hitler. So at his induction ceremony, you know, it's a fairly famous picture now, but at the time Dark Mission came out, I don't think very many people had seen it, is there's a picture at um, von Braun's SS induction ceremony where he was made a major in the SS and Himmler's, you know, stepping right in front of him just after the rites had been concluded. So they're a secret society. And guess what? When you dig into the SS, you find out the SS worship Isis, Osiris, Horus, and Seth. You've got the magicians, uh, the black magic cult out at JPL. They all worship these same gods, as did the Freemasons. So it becomes a very consistent uh, pattern across the board. And I think you're looking at an organization that was controlled at the top by the Freemasons and, and you know, implemented by the Nazis and also you know, major contributions from from the, the Black Magic cult out at JPL, which, by the way, JPL, th- their anniversary is coming up. Happy anniversary, guys, on Halloween. So that's that's when JPL was founded. It's on Halloween Day. They put out a they actually put out a nativity scene there with Jack Parsons and Ed Foreman and a bunch of other people. They put these dummies out. They call it a nativity scene on Halloween at JPL. So uh, it's it, you know it's kind of a, a freak show out there, but. Um, if you look at World War II, you can actually look at it as a fight between the Freemasons and probably the Teutonic Knights because the Nazi movement, if you trace it, basically broke off 
from the Knights Templar back, gosh, probably, you know, probably in the 1400s. And they ended up coming back together to have this fight over who was going to run things. And, you know, I think that that what you're showing there, the Nazis didn't lose, they moved to America, is probably pretty accurate. I, I know uh, Eric Von Daniken has met Hermann Oberth and told me a few stories about some of the crazy stuff that uh, Oberth told him. So I think all these things are connected and true. And it's just um, the question we have to figure out is what's the agenda and, and you know, where are they going with it? Mm -hmm. Well, one, one of the things that I kind of like explored in, in my books was this whole theme of um, the Germans setting up a breakaway society in South America and Antarctica after the war, and that the paperclip scientists were kind of like a fifth column to kind of like infiltrate and take over and influence the American space program. And at the end of the day, after deals had been struck, that to my mind, um, the Apollo mission was like a, a huge money laundering operation to kind of get a lot of personnel, a lot of funds, a lot of resources down to the German real space program taking place in South America and Antarctica, and and what you had and what NASA had to show the rocket program was just a was just a, a show that that the real space program was happening down in Antarctica, and that the Germans were giving the Americans access and kind of introducing them to all this advanced tech and ETs and all. so what what do you what's your position on that? Well, I'm not an expert on Antarctica. I, I've written a little bit about uh, High Jump in uh, in my Hidden Agenda book and stuff, and I've written a little bit about the South America stuff, and it's all fascinating. And of course, we have to all give some homage to um, or recognition to Joe Farrell's books, uh, Reich of the Black Sun, which talks about you know how they we couldn't have detonated an atomic bomb at the end of World War II. It was probably German triggers and German designs, and maybe even German uranium, and um, and, you know, the, it's obvious that the history that we've been taught is not the history of that really happened, that, that really took place. So I think when you look at it, what I see from that period is that the Germans had the technical knowledge, but America had the resources. So we brought them over to get those resources and, and you know, give them the resources to make the rockets. I really do feel that like von Braun was definitely doing the best he could. And if you look at his history, I think I talk about this in my book, The Choice, which is my second book. If you look at his history, he was fascinated with flying saucer technology, basically field propulsion systems. And this all took place after the Explorer One mission, which was the first successful rocket launch really for the US. Um, and that indicates that he was to me on the outside looking in on some of this more advanced technology. So I wonder if maybe the American public space program, the one you talk about, was sort of run by people who knew that there was this other secret space program, but couldn't get to it, were blocked from it. Maybe Kennedy and, and a lot of the so-called public people wanted to use the uh, American space program, the rocket programs, to go to the moon, let's say, and retrieve ancient alien technology and do some reverse engineering on it, which I think they believed that the, the Nazis had done or they, they had met some civilizations in Antarctica. That's definitely a possibility there as, as well. So, um, you know, by the way, the story that you just told, it, I ha I've heard from somebody who knew Gus Grissom, who was second American in space, that that's exactly what Gus Grissom thought. He was complaining vociferously before the Apollo 1 fire about how, oh, we're just spamming a can. They've already been to the moon. They've already been to Mars. They've got half these flying, all these flying saucers. You see, that's our stuff. We're way ahead of the, of the curve, um, but they're not, that we're just for show. We're just trying to convince everybody that we, you know, this is our, these are our limitations. We can only go this fast. We can only go this fast and stuff like that. And really, you know, Michael, if you look at, if you look at how technology evolves, right? Technological curves like, like processor speeds and things like that, they, they basically just go straight up. They go, they shoot to the top. And if you look at the development of transportation technology from, from a man walking to a horse, to a horse and buggy, to a steam train, to a propeller airplane, to a jet airplane, to a rocket, the curve goes straight up. 
And then it just goes flat in 1960. So if you look at that curve, if it follows every other technological curve in human history, there had to be a breakthrough about 1960. And that, that's what one of my books, Hidden Agenda, is about. Um, and the question is, what happened to that breakthrough? Where did they take it? What did they do with it? And I think, you know, I, I'm going to bow to you on that. I think you're a lot more of an expert on that than I am. But I certainly am fascinated and interested in, in that process. And I, I believe that you're absolutely correct, that there is sort of a separate, um, I don't want to use necessarily breakaway civilization, but there is some breakaway technology that's definitely been developed. It is a fascinating topic. Um, one of your your books uh, deals with um, the the role of secret societies and and ancient aliens, and you know you describe ancient aliens creating humanity, and you know this is where the stories of the Anunnaki come in, mm -hmm. uh, Enki and Enlil, the Great Flood. So you know what's your take on that ancient history? in terms of the creation of humanity, you know, who were Enlil and Enki and how do they relate to us today? You know, that's a, that's one of my favorite books because I started out thinking it was going to be one thing <laughs> and then it, it took over, it took me over and did com it completely went off in another direction. I never had a book do that before. Um, if you look at human civilization, it appears to have developed from the sky down right? It, it starts at, at higher altitudes. And if that isn't a confirmation that there was a global flood, whether it was the Younger Dryas impact event, which is very popular. And I think I actually had Randall Carlson in that book before Graham Hancock ever published anything about Randall, Randall Carlson. It's like, wait a minute, I, I beat him to that. But actually, Graham turned me on to Randall. So um, that's fair. But if you look at it, it's very clear that human society started at high altitude and then it worked its way down to sea level as the sea level probably continued to diminish. Um, so that implies that there was a global flood that hit that civilization kind of restarted. And then the question becomes, well, how did you get the technology to build monumental architecture like Go Gobekli Tepe? And, and, you know, how did this stuff all evolve? And the only way that really makes a lot of sense is if Sitchin stories of the Anunnaki are actually true, that there was this existing civilization that um, that was here and then the flood happened. Maybe it was something they couldn't prevent. Maybe it was something they allowed to happen. Um, there's a lot of religious aspects to it also. If you look at the war between Enki and Enlil, the two Anunnaki kings that were sort of fighting over the earth, you know, they had two very different philosophies. One of them thought that the creation of man was an abomination. One of them thought that it was a, a gift from God. And, and so we have these two different mythologies. And I think that they kind of led to, you know, God and Satan in, in the Bible. I think that that's, those guys kind of represented those two perspectives. One who wants to, um, embolden man and enrich man and one who wants to corrupt man and destroy man. And, you know, I, I just thought there was a lot of meat to that. And one of the things I did in that book that was ended up being fascinating to me was that if you look at Sitchin's book, The Lost Book of Enki, he calls it historical fiction. But I don't know, I'm sure you've know Jordan Maxwell or knew of Jordan before he passed away, the late Jordan Maxwell. But Jordan told me one time, he said, Mike, Sitchin told me that that book is, is not channeled and it's not fiction. He said that Sitchin told him that Enki is still alive and dictated it to him. That it's basically like interview with a vampire, only it's interview with an Anunnaki. Um, so when I read back and read it, I, I was just fascinated by the human tragedy of the story um, in the sense that they're related to us. They're human like we are. Um, we have there's some part of us that's from them. And maybe that maybe that's what Neil Armstrong meant when he said that's one small step for man, meaning us and a giant leap for mankind, meaning this greater family of humanity that lives throughout this solar system and maybe throughout this galaxy. Um, 
So, you know, looking at it from that perspective, I was fascinated by the fact that that um, Sitchin actually claimed to have met him. And then, you know, Robert O. Dean, I don't know, I don't remember if I put this part in the book, but Bob Dean, if you remember Robert O. Dean, he was a fairly well-known UFO researcher, one of the old, the old school guys, the original ones. And he told me once, he said, you know, I think he used to say this in his lectures, you know, Mike, extraterrestrials aren't in the government. Extraterrestrials are the government. And they're here trying to fix the karma from all the bad stuff that they did on Earth back in, you know, the last few thousand years. Um, and, I, you know, that seems very far fetched and pretty wild. But here's the thing, Michael, I'm 100 percent convinced that there is an artificial constructed humanoid, half human, half lion face on the surface of Mars. And once you accept that that's reality, then nothing can be off the table, right? And, and so what I was told um, as part of that process is that uh, Bob believed that there was a very specific officer in the US Space Command who was in fact Enki. <laughs> no, I don't know. That's crazy. That sounds crazy, but um, it could be true. If you believe that even part of the rest of this stuff is true, you have to be open to the possibility. And that's kind of where I, kind yes. of where I approach it. Yeah, that, that is fascinating. I mean, I, I remember reading the Lost Book of Enki and how different it was to the other books that Sitchin had written that, that were much kind of denser and they were written in that kind of dry, scholarly <laughs> style. Yeah. But the Lost Book of Enki was kind of very interesting. It, it had this kind of uh, humanistic theme running through it. And, of course, Enki is depicted as this kind of lover or protector of humanity and mm -hmm. Enlil as this kind of like, uh, you know, this kind of really over-the-top self-righteous being. Like God and Satan, yeah, almost like God and Satan. Right. And so, but that's that that's new to me. That's the first time I've heard that uh, Sitchin said that he had met Enki and that Enki had dictated that book to him. And, um, you know, that's very interesting. So it shows that Enki is truly... And eternal, that the Anunnaki, they, they live for tens of thousands of years. And, of course, you have the King's List that describes these different beings living for, like, up to 30,000 years. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, and, you know, yeah. even even human beings, one of the things I covered in Ancient Aliens and Secret Societies, you know, is the age of human beings. If you look at the Bible, oh, well, this guy lived 900 years and this guy lived 700 years. And how is that possible? Well, if the water vapor canopy theory is true, then and there was no rain there was no rainbows there you couldn't see the stars the earth was protected from the sun's harmful rays um for centuries and centuries and centuries or tens of thousands of years it makes a lot of sense now the argument against it is that well the air pressure would be far too great but would it really be great michael if everybody was living on the tops of mountains and, and the answer is no it wouldn't so that argument doesn't exactly hold up because if there was this water vapor canopy uh it could have protected people there was never any rain there was just this natural moisture and dew and rivers and streams and things like that and it, it it's kind of a much healthier sort of holistic existence for man it's literally it sounds like the garden of eden right which is what Sitchin talked about, the Eden or Ed, Edin or however it's pronounced. Um, and, you know, I, I talking with Carlson, with Randall Carlson, you know, I said, if, if, a, if this thing existed and if it was shattered by a comet, let's say, um, could it rain for 40, 40 nights? And he said, absolutely. It would be, be about that long for all this moisture to sort of rain itself down on earth and, Resculpt the land and fill everything in. So that's pretty incredible um, when you put all this stuff together. And and um, yeah, and again, I'm just going to say that's what Jordan told me. I don't know. And Bob Dean suggested. I they're both passed away now. They can't speak for themselves. But that's the information I got. And so I just like to tell people that because I think it's a great story among other things. Um, and it fits with kind of what we know about about human society. But the problem, of course, is that absolute power corrupts absolute knowledge. And if knowledge is power, I think the secret societies really got off track. Um, they started to enjoy, you know, their 
private jets and her limousines a little too much. Not that they had those back in back in the in the uh, ancient Egypt, but you know, I mean, I think it's the same thing. They enjoyed the trappings of power, and um, and it became corrupted to the point that it's now secret. We were supposed to, Michael. We were supposed to be told all this stuff thousands of years ago about our real history, and they've just kept it for a long, long time. Yeah, definitely. It uh, has been covered up for a long time. I, I remember two books that kind of like really influenced me you know, when I got interested in this whole exopolitics topic was uh, Jim Ma's Rule by Secrecy and mm -hmm. William Bramley's Gods of Eden. So, you know, w would you agree that they that they were kind of like on the money? That yes, this is the way it's been for thousands of years. That extraterrestrials have ruled humanity through these secret societies who have really kind of like been the minions of these ETs. It look it looks like that. Um, uh, and at least to the point that they control our upper levels of government. I'm not saying that they control every aspect of our lives or what we choose to have for dinner, but um, yeah, I think that we've been guided along a certain path that's probably beneficial to them as opposed to being necessarily beneficial to humanity. And, you know, the, the question is why? I mean, why, why would ETs want us to be at war all the time? Um, why would they want all this conflict in the world? And, and uh, there's different theories about this, but nobody really knows because we don't, we don't have one. We can't sit one down and, and grill them, you know, and you know, waterboard them a little bit and say, okay, you know, what's going on here? So um, I, I'd like to know what the answer to that is, but it, sometimes, you know, it can be just as, as um, simple as we're in a cycle. We're in a, we're in a natural cycle of consciousness and physics. And a lot of people have talked about this and I talked about it in the, in the choice where it's just not time for us to know yet. So we were kept, we've been kept in the dark and hopefully that whole occulted age of Pisces is coming to an end and we're, we're moving into Aquarius now where we will start to know the truth. And I mean, you look at our, you look at news and the news, Michael, and it's as horrific as it is. Um, there's a lot of stuff coming out. There's a lot of secrets that are being told. If you pay attention, if you care, if you're focused, you're finding out a lot of things that you didn't know were true five or 10 years ago. I mean, my whole perspective on, on political reality is completely different than it was 10 or 10 years ago, simply based on all the things we've learned. So with the, the great flood, I mean, that's kind of like a, a pivotal event, not only in Sumerian history. I mean, you have the Epic of Gilgamesh. Sure. Um, you, you have also in the scriptures, the, the, the Bible and many cultures, they describe this great flood. Now, also, you have Plato describing the end of Atlantis and it's being submerged under the sea. So are we talking about the same event, you know, that coincides with the end of the Younger Dryas about, what was it, uh, 11,000 years ago, 13,000 years ago? Yeah. And by the way, that, that image looks great. That image looks almost exactly like the uh, underground, uh, underwater city off Cuba, doesn't it? I mean, it looks a lot like, it looks a lot like that underwater city that they found in, in Cuba. Um yeah, it, it is. I think it is the same event that they're talking about, because I don't see how human memory could go back much longer than that. You know, I mean, you, you can tell stories, you can pass them down the line. And then all of a sudden along, you know, along comes David, the, uh, the slacker historian who forgets to tell his kids the story and it stops. So I, I do think it's all connected to that particular event, which I, I think now I think we're getting pretty good at identifying it as the Younger Dryas. Because remember when Graham Hancock started talking about this, um, especially back with like the message of the Sphinx, we didn't have the Younger Dryas impact event evidence. We didn't have any of that. So it's been, it's been 20, 25 years and we get more and more confirmations of this cataclysmic event that took place. Uh, and we're still trying to sort out what exactly happened and which aspects of it are true and which aspects of it are not. But yeah, it makes um, it does fit all the evidence that this was uh, at least one major catastrophic event, climate changing catastrophic event that um, happened to the Earth about twelve or thirteen thousand years ago. And even you know, even the ancient Egyptian legends talk about a time 
a time before the moon, which is weird. Maybe the moon was there, but we just couldn't see it through the water vapor canopy, if that existed. You know, it, it's one of those things. But, you know, you ever ask yourself, why is, why is a circle 360 degrees? And why are there these ancient Egyptian legends uh, basically saying that Isis, Osiris, and Horus, and Seth were represented by the extra days of the calendar? that were added. And so if you put this all together, you start to think to yourself, well, maybe the reason our year is 365 days rather than 360 days is because it used to be 360 days until this big comet hit the earth and knocked it out of its orbit and messed us all up. Um, and all that stuff kind of fits together too, because I mean, again, does anybody know the origin of 360 degrees for a circle? I don't think they really do. But it makes sense if it was the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And it makes sense that an ancient culture like the Anunnaki would have astronomical knowledge of that type and that they would have passed that down to a culture like Atlantis or Lemuria who, who would know all this stuff. Um, and it's all now we've just got fragments. It's like we're looking at the Copper Scrolls or we're looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls and we got a little piece of the puzzle here and a little piece of the puzzle there. We just don't have the whole jigsaw yet, the whole jigsaw puzzle. We're still working on that. Well, one of your your books uh, is is a kind of favorite of mine. Uh, the, the topic is I find fascinating. That's uh, ancient aliens and JFK, the race to the moon and, and the Kennedy assassination. So you you describe the the real agenda behind uh, Kennedy's pledge to get Americans to the moon and the Apollo mm -hmm. program. So so what was that real agenda? Well, I think it was, uh, and by the way, I cited you in the book, and I, I your work on on James Forrestal is is critical to putting all the pieces together because of the fact that Kennedy and Forrestal were were so close, and Forrestal, of course, was a member of MJ12. So, kind of the my theory is is kind of what we talked about earlier, which is that Kennedy knew that there were aliens, and we talk about the different ways he might have known before he became president that, that aliens were a thing. Um, I suggest that when he was with Forrestal, I mean, they were within a few hours drive at one point of the um, Nazi, the experimental Nazi uh, base that Hans Kammler was running in Silesia, where they had the Nazi bell. And it's entirely possible that they visited that facility during one of the trips where Kennedy was, you know, covering James Forrestal as a reporter. Um, and so Kennedy could have found out that way. I also think it's it seems like Forrestal would have been his source for back in night. That's not my, that's not in my house, but I live in Las Vegas. So it's not my, it's not my rooster. Um, I may have a barking dog later, but not a rooster. So there's this apparent indication that Kennedy knew about aliens before he became president. And when he became president, he started asking about it. And that put him on the bad side of MJ 12. And MJ-12, of course, a very secretive organization, um, definitely existed. I think Kent and Friedman proved that way, way back, that they were definitely a, a, a thing when MJ-12 existed. And what Kennedy wanted to do was he wanted to get this secret technology out of the hands of these unelected, I want to say bureaucrats, but they're far more dangerous than bureaucrats. Yeah, they're intelligence intelligence organizations that have their own agenda, nothing to do with what's good for America. Um, and so the way he decided to do that was to go to the moon in public and quietly, I think the plan was to retrieve this ancient alien technology and bring it back to Earth. And that was sort of okay with MJ-12. It was sort of okay for a while until he started pitching this, the idea to the Russians that we go together. Now, when Kennedy, you know, I, I have this meme I post all the time, and it shows pictures of American politicians, Democrats, Republicans, media types, and it says, your enemy is not in Russia. And I think Kennedy figured out that our enemy was not in Russia. Our enemy was in our own secret societies, secret organizations. And I mean, he even came out, like one of the first speeches he gave as president was, these secret societies exist. He called them right out in the president of the press and said, I need your help from the press to expose this secrecy, which is unwarranted. So I think his long-term agenda was 
he was going to tell the American people that aliens were a thing. And he felt like that they weren't necessarily hostile. Um, but what he proposed to the Russians was why fight each other and go to the moon and compete? Why not go together? Why not join together and bring the two countries together and try to um, try to bridge these, these differences that we have, philosophical differences, ideological differences? Unfortunately, Khrushchev, when Kennedy first proposed that in Vienna in 1961, and this is all documented, um, viewed Kennedy as weak. So as a result, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. He started to push Kennedy, thinking he could get some more leverage on him. So after that happened, Kennedy sat down again, sent him a message and said, hey, look, let's stop fighting about going to the moon. Let's go to the moon together because we have to make sure we never get that close to nuclear war again. And although Khrushchev was tempted the second time, he didn't go for it because the Russians were still ahead of the United States technologically. But the third time, when Kennedy proposed, it was in September, uh, September 20th, I believe, of 1963, less, a little more than two months before he was murdered. He said, uh, let's go to the moon together. And he did it in public. And according to Khrushchev's son, Sergei, who was a senior uh, fellow diplomat at um, Brown University, his father had accepted the last week of October or first week of November, 1963, his father had accepted. And we know that this is almost certainly true because what Kennedy did then is he issued two national security action memos, one telling NASA to open an office to get ready to exchange technological information with the Russians. And the other one, the explosive one, the second one, very explosive one, where he basically sent it to Alan Dulles, who was head of CIA, and said, we need to tell them about whatever our secret space programs are so that they can tell the difference, the Russians could tell the difference between bona fide, bona fide UFOs and our secret space technology. And, and then you have, after that, you have the Byrne Memo, which pretty clearly I think is authored by Alan Dulles. It's been established by people like Dr. Bob Wood that it's a real thing where he basically said, this guy is sticking his nose into our business and we cannot allow this. I want your answer on what we should do by the end of October. Um, and of course, you know, 10 days after he issued those two national security action memos, they, they murdered President Kennedy in Dealey Plaza in Dallas. And uh, I, think, I think we have a really good idea who the two shooters were, I think there were two. I mean, you know, other people have more complex scenarios. I said they only needed to. And I think we have a lot of, of film and video, um, film evidence and photographic evidence of who those two people were. And, um, you know, it was all, I think, sort of behind the scenes organized by Johnson, not because Johnson, President Johnson, uh, Vice President Lyndon Johnson was um, cared about aliens or UFOs or MJ-12, I just think he saw an opportunity to uh, take the king's throne. And so he did and got behind it. And we can, there's all kinds of evidence of that that we could talk about and a lot of symbolic, uh, Masonic, symbolic, sicky, sick stuff that Johnson did. Um, the burn, the burn memo. Yeah. And that was uh, a set of directives, eight directives. And, mm -hmm. and one of the directives that kind of really stood out is project environment. And, and Bob, Bob Wood, you mentioned Dr. Wood, uh, he, his conclusion was that that was an actual assassination directive. So, so what do you think? Was this project environment directive essentially a kind of like an assassination uh, directive for yeah. any anyone to eliminate whoever in Washington was an obstacle to MJ-12 projects. Right. And, and they specifically state in the, in the memo that the uh, obstacle was Lancer. Lancer was John F. Kennedy's code name. Um, yeah. A project environment where it talks about how if the weather, uh, if we have any weather, it should be wet, which is symbolic of wet works. So it's clear that he thought this memo might get out someday. Dulles did. But yeah, absolutely. That is saying, you know, these are the options. These are the different things we can do. 
one of them is let's kill the guy. And uh, I believe that was what MJ-12 ultimately decided on, was to, to murder the president 10 days later. That's why, you know, when you look at the Kennedy assassination, it seems very haphazard. It seems very sloppy. It doesn't seem, people say the CIA did it. Well, there are a lot more powerful forces behind the CIA, I think MJ-12 being, being the primary one. It's a very sloppy operation. Lee Harvey Oswald was not a very reliable person. He was, he, you know, he was a wannabe assassin. Um, but if you have decided you're going to do this and you have a window of opportunity in 10 days, it, it completely fits really with what they did. If you look at these two assassins and I say it's Oswald in the sixth floor window and JD Tippett on the grassy knoll, um, it, that's what you would do. You would have a fairly sloppy operation like that. You would have sort of a, a haphazard, um, you know, setup like this because it's hard to find uh, quality guys that can do a job like that in ten days. Taking out the president, and getting away with it, is not an easy task. So you had Oswald and Ruby and J.D. Tippett, and you know, again, one of the things that inspired me to write that book is the 2017 Trump documents where I think the key document is an FBI um, memo that says that Oswald, Tippett, and Ruby met in Jack Ruby's strip club seven days before the assassination. So they all knew each other. And that explains a lot of strange stuff about J.D. Tippett. I, I saw, there's a video that I saw on YouTube the other day that talks about J.D. Tippett's movements on that day. And witnesses saw him here and he was, he was waiting at a gas station. And there was th then apparently he got very upset because whoever he was supposed to meet didn't show up. So then he went away and went looking for him. Well, that was Oswald and Oswald shot him dead on the street as soon as he saw him. So you have, you know, Oswald and, and Tippett kill the president. You have Oswald killing Tippett, Ruby killing Oswald. And then Jack Ruby is your single point failure. You know, Michael, in engineering, you don't want to have any single point failures. Single point failure means if that one thing goes, we lose everything. We lose the entire space shuttle. If, if you punch a hole in the wing, we lose the entire space shuttle. It's a single point failure. Um, and Jack Ruby was the only guy at the end that was still living three days afterwards that knew what the plot was. And he never talked. So um, he made noises about talking, but he never did. So there's just a lot of... Um, fascinating detail there's the famous photo of of the motorcade and the president's already been hit in the back and he's you know surging forward and his fet, clen, uh, fists are clenched and then you look two limousines back and you see um senator um yarborough and lady bird johnson and lbj is not there He's, he's ducking because he knew as soon as they came around that corner that they were going to start shooting. And then you talk about Masonic symbolism. Well, did you know, Mike, Michael, did you know that they had um, secretly decided to remodel the Oval Office when the president went to Dallas, Texas? They didn't tell anybody. So you knew that, right? And then and they remodeled it. And they took out the very tasteful blue gray carpet and put in a red garish red carpet and it had blood red blood red curtains which the kennedy people as soon as they got back they ordered them to take down this was all organized and planned out by lady bird johnson and so then you know kennedy had his rocking chair that he liked so lbj takes his rocking chair so he literally when you look at these pictures of lbj in the oval office in this blood red carpet He's literally sitting on Kennedy's throne, swimming in Kennedy's blood. The, you know, the, the king has, ki he's killed the king. He's taken the king's throne. He's taken the king's, uh, you know, he's got the king's blood all over him. That's completely Masonic in its ritualistic, um, ritualistic expression. So, and again, it, uh, he was a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemason, Lyndon Johnson. So, you look at this and it's it's very clear that it was a hit and i don't i don't think you need all these complex scenarios with woody harrelson's dad and some guy shooting from the drain i mean have you ever been to dealey plaza no i have been and, and again my my theory it's other people's theory but i'm sort of 
taking the pieces that I think actually fit. You know, I believe the witness named Gordon Arnold, who said he was he went up to the grassy knoll and a shot went past his ear and he hit the deck. And there's the Mary Mormon photograph, which appears to show him and a character named that they named the badge man, which is a guy in a Dallas policeman's uniform with no hat on shooting a rifle like this. And you look at the outline of the badge man and the ears and the eyebrows and the, the male baldness pattern. And it's J.D. Tippett. There's no question it's J.D. Tippett. So you guys have this simple scenario where you have two gunmen, one from behind, one from the front. And I stood there at the picket fence, right where Tippett was supposedly, according to Gordon Arnold, standing. And I'm looking at that, Michael, and I'm watching cars go by. And, and the president's limo, remember, was going slow. It was going about 10 miles an hour. Honestly, I'm not a great shot, especially not with a rifle. I think I could have made that shot. A good marksman, somebody who was a police officer who was trained in firearms, could have easily made that shot. A couple of my friends absolutely could have made that shot. So it, it's sometimes the simplest explanation is, is the right one. Sometimes Occam's razor is correct. Um, and I recently, there's also another witness. Um, I just saw another video. He was inter being interviewed at the time, and he was up on the uh, overpass, and he saw a puff of smoke from the grassy knoll. And I've actually, there's actually a video, which I've lost. I'm just like driving myself nuts. It's, it's on some hard drive somewhere on a previous computer of mine that shows a puff of smoke coming up from the grassy knoll. And by the way, the ammo that you would have used in a Manlik or Carcano rifle, and I assume Oswald and Tippett would have used the same weapon. Um, if you know that way that that way the forensics would indicate it all came from one gun um but it would have puffed like that and and so you you have all these different uh witnesses and then you have this guy who said he said he saw all the dallas police motorcycle police officers run up the grassy knoll they ran right up there's the orville nix film which is from farther away which shows these officers stopping and pointing and running up to the and you know looking like they're going to head up to the grassy knoll. There's the Marie Muchmore film, which shows I, I I was going through that and I just I kind of hit pause and I I happened to hit a frame of it where you can see like a blood red mist in front of the president's head and you can see his hair is pushed straight up but the back of his head is fine so it appears that she captured a frame of the split second that the bullet had entered the front of his head already but hadn't exited the back and it just completely belies the idea that he was hit from behind and again having stood up on the grassy knoll behind the picket fence right where it looks like the badge man was it's an easy shot it's an easy shot well one of the documents uh, that you mentioned uh, is this cia document that came out uh on uh well it it shows a, it's a memorandum from uh, President Kennedy to CIA Director John McCone, and on it there's handwriting, and it, the handwriting is uh, by William Colby, who was the section head of, uh, I think, the CIA desk in Vietnam at the mm -hmm. time, later became the CIA director. Um, and and he, in his handwriting he says, um, I mean, clearly McCone is asking, what do I do about this? Because as you said, that CIA document, I mean, that document to the CIA director was saying, share all your UFO files with NASA, right. who's going to share it with uh, the Soviets. And what do I do? And Colby says, well, uh, Colby says in his handwriting, uh, uh, Helms has the directive. And so, I mean, to me, that's a smoking gun that the project environment was implemented because of this document. I yep. mean, what do, you, what do you say to that? I agree with you 100%. I agree with you 100%. I think this document is absolutely authentic. Um, and, you know, look, I, there's a kind of an old joke. It wasn't a question of who wanted to kill President Kennedy. It was a question of who didn't want to kill him because everybody wanted to kill him. But when he started actually implementing measures to go to the moon in cooperation with the, the Soviet Union, which meant that the Russians were going to get their hands on ancient alien technology. Let's call it Anunnaki technology that had been left behind on the moon. 
when he actually began to implement it, that's that was the last straw. That was when they decided we have to get rid of this guy. And that's when they started the whole process. And again, it was a it was a sloppy job. That's why there's so many holes in it. That's why there's so many problems with it. That's why there's so many questions about it. But it's probably the best they could do in 10 days. They found two guys who are willing to be the gunman. And um, and to me, that's the scenario that makes the most sense. And, and I absolutely think that document's authentic and that that was the last straw for the deep state for MJ-12. We can call them, you know, I, I thought about doing a book. I haven't written a book in a few years, Ancient Aliens and the Deep State, you know, or something along that lines of that title. But I'm not quite sure how it's going to end yet. So I, I can't write a book unless I know what the ending is. Right? Fair enough. Well, you know, let's bring it down. Let's bring it to this kind of contemporary era because there's so much that's that's happening. So, um, you know, clearly there's been a shift, a pretty profound shift in terms of uh, the UFO issue suddenly being taken seriously after decades of being dismissed. And now all of a sudden every major agency and think tank is uh, starting to pay attention. So you have this uh, hearing in Congress on July 26th in the House uh, Oversight Committee, and uh, David Grush is the, the kind of like the, the main witness, if you like, who right. is talking about these um, reverse engineering programs that he has been told by others that are part of those programs. So, you know, what, what do you make of that? What do you see is going to emerge from these kind of revelations? Well, I see... First thing I see there that gives me great pause is James Clapper sitting to the left of Grush and right behind him. You've got Knapp, you've got Corbell, you've got uh, Clapper, and you've got another guy who is a deep stater, used to be C, uh, high up director of intelligence. So what I see is I see that this is a controlled, um, very specific agenda that's being pushed. And I, it's like, I feel like in our community, in the UFO community, we're all, we're so happy. Oh, they're finally noticing us. They're finally paying attention to us. And then we just jump onto these guys. Like they, a lot of people did with Lou Elizondo and Grush. And the thing that people forget about Elizondo and Grush is that they're both counterintelligence agents, which makes them sort of paid liars, right? That's what they do is they, they, they misdirect the enemy. Well, who's the enemy in this case? Is it us? Is it the public? So I'm extremely skeptical of this. Um, and I, and you know, I, I, again, I've been asked this question a little bit. Do you trust these people? And uh, you know, do you do you believe what they're saying is true? And uh, well, yeah. I mean, who doesn't know at this point, Michael? That we have crashed alien flight saucers. That we have alien bodies. That we might have even had some direct communication with extraterrestrial or alien civilizations. Did you watch the X-Files? You know, I mean, that's my feeling on it. Of course we know that. Um, so what's different is that now it's being allowed to be talked about in the political arena. So to me, there has to be a political agenda behind it. And my my thing is trying to sort out what that agenda is. If, you know, again, Clapper is not somebody I trust. I don't think he's, uh, I think he's deep state spook. I don't know if you agree with me. I don't know if I'm making you mad here. Next to uh, George Knapp, actually, it's not James Clapper. I mean, he looks like him, but it's not him. Uh, that's so people have pointed that out because because people ask that, that question. Not Clapper, okay, no, I like not Clapper. Who it is then because it sure looks like him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it does. It does look like him. Wow. And that figure, McCullough, the other guy is McCullough in the blue suit. He's correct. He's, yes. Yeah. Yes. He's he, he's he's currently the uh, he's representing. Uh, David Grush. Uh, you know, my my thing with David Grush is that um, I, I I have reservations because uh, he seems to focus on well, you know, two things actually. The, the the national security threat. You know, he tends to kind of agree that uh, the UFOs are a national security threat, and second, uh, that oh yes, uh, we got our hands on these things, but they were too difficult to reverse engineer. No one understands how they work. And, um, and and so to me, that's kind of like, it's like there's a limited hangout, but they're getting, they're putting out some of the truth, but not all of it. 
Right. And they're putting out the part that suits whatever the agenda is. And again, I agree with you. It, you know, aliens bad is the agenda. Well, I don't think aliens are any different than people. Uh, you meet people every day. Some people are good. Some people are bad. Some people are criminals. Some people are sociopaths. Some people are, you know, genocidal maniacs. Um, I don't think aliens are going to be any different than that. And uh, so the question then becomes, I agree with you 100%, is why are they pushing the alien scary agenda? And a lot of people think, well, they're going to stage, you know, a fake alien invasion. They sometimes mistakenly call it Project Bluebeam, but that was, I believe, supposed to be the staged second coming of Christ, not an alien invasion. But some people think that they're going to do that to try to um, push everybody into into accepting more uh, more restraints on our freedoms and more security. But I, I, from what I hear, that's not really going to fly. So um, I, I do think it's the same thing is why is the agenda aliens bad? We don't know why they're here. We don't know what their objectives are. Uh, and we shouldn't assume that they're good or bad. We should assume that they are here for whatever um, for what for for their own reasons that may or may not be good for humanity we don't know think of this um you uh, unidentified anomalous uh, phenomenon disclosure act for 2023 that was passed unanimously by the senate uh chuck schumer no less is behind that i mean this is the same guy that you know was, was leading the charge to get, get trump impeached and so forth so i mean is is this a deep state ploy or is, is this kind of like you know um taking action because you you can't stop something that's that's coming it's just kind of like you know yeah. covering your ass you know in a way because you you can't stop what's coming so let's let's put this out so what do you think's going on with that disclosure act you're, you're putting me on the spot here. What do I think about it? Well, first of all, if it's sponsored by Chuck Schumer, I don't trust it. I don't, I think Schumer, there's things I know about Schumer. I can't even tell you uh, on this or any other podcast. I, I'd get in real trouble. Um, he's, you know, he's not on our side, meaning the good people of the planet. Um, and so I, if he's pushing it, it's not a good thing. So um, I think it's great that we're getting this attention. But I think what we need to do is to is to blow it up. I mean, what, what I think, Michael, is that we need to take advantage of them opening this door because they're opening it for their own reasons. And I, I, I can speculate about the reasons. The reason being, again, they're trying to push the alien agenda as a distraction for other things in politics. It, it seems to me that you could do you could do easier things than aliens. Right. There's easier ways to distract people. Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. You know, there's there's lots of ways you can get certain headlines off the news if you want to, uh, rather than go for the alien thing. So if they've opened this Pandora's box, I say our job in the community is to force through our own agenda on it. We need to be asking a lot of tough questions. You know, I I got put on Fox News to talk about some of this stuff, and I said, I for me the question is not whether or not we've got alien technology or whether we you know got alien bodies. The question is, what have they been doing with them for the last 70 or 80 years? And that's what we have to push. We need to ask, why are the witnesses, people like David Grush, at, who all come from the intelligence community, why aren't they people like Michael Sala? Why aren't they people like Whitley Strieber? Why aren't they people like Travis Walton, who've had experiences and interactions with these beings? Why aren't we, if we're really at the edge of believing that aliens might be real, then why don't we get some people who know something about aliens to talk about? Why don't we get Richard Hoagland up there to talk about what he's seen on the moon? And why don't we get some people in there to talk about what NASA has covered up for decades and decades in their explorations of the solar system? That's where I think we have an opportunity to exploit the, the um, gap that's been created now by them doing this. So I guess my response to it is, okay, let's not care about who created this act Let's use it to our own advantage. But in order to do that, we have to be a little more unified and coordinated, and we have to not crawl all over each other to be the first one to have the scoop. You know, that that gets us into a lot of trouble sometimes too. Over the next six months or so, I mean, it, should we look forward to some major disclosures, official disclosure through Congress, or are the aliens going to do something? Is there going to be a false flag event? You know, the next six months, what, what's your crystal ball tell you? You can argue that what happened this past weekend was a false flag. 
uh, in some sense, and that it stopped a lot of other historic changes that are going on. But honestly, Michael, I feel like I feel like aliens are part of what's going to happen, but they're not they're not the main thing. I think we're going to be so overwhelmed with uh, social political um, changes and shocks to our system in the next six months to a year that I, I'm not sure we're going to have much time to talk about aliens. I think aliens w- w- are going to be a welcome distraction from all the stuff we're going to go through because I look at the economic situation worldwide and I do not see how it can continue. Um, you keep printing money. It has less and less value. We're all suffering the consequences of that. I, I just think at some point there's like a major collapse coming economically. And there are people who are trying to start World War III. And uh, there's no there's no doubt in my mind that some of our political leaders are trying to start World War III. And we have all of this other stuff happening. And I think aliens are going to be a part of that. But are they going to be just a distraction? Oh, wait, 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 wait. We're done. We're not doing World War III this week. We're going to do aliens this week. Are, I believe the aliens are fully capable of creating a shock event, you know, coming out and flying over major cities. So everybody sees them and nobody can deny it. But Michael, we're at the point now where with the hologram technology and the rumors about Project Blue Beam, who's going to believe it, right? Are people? I mean, even if real aliens really showed up, would the people, uh, the majority of people believe it? And I don't know that they would. So, I mean, I see a tremendous amount of turmoil in the next year. I, I just, at this point, I, uh, I have my own beliefs about where it's going to go, but I'm not sure I want to, I want to talk about that stuff publicly. I, I think I, well, let me talk about it. What the hell? I, I think that all of our hierarchies and structures are going to come under such incredible stress that they're basically going to collapse. Um, that means our banking system, our financial systems, uh, and, and uh, our banking system and our financial system are two different things, by the way. Our military hierarchies and structures, they're all going to collapse. And by that, I don't mean just the United States. I mean all around the world. Infrastructure is going to come under tremendous pressure. The question we don't know the answer to is, is there somebody out there that has a plan, that sees this coming and has a plan to fix it? I think there is. A lot of people don't. I think there is a plan to fix it. And so I'm kind of sitting back saying, let's just let it happen. Let's let's start the dominoes and let's let it happen. Because I, I don't see how you can look around the world at all the secrecy and you know the secrecy about aliens, the secrecy about our history and why we really went to the moon and what's in Antarctica and and the, you know who really won World War II. We can't continue to live like this. We have to start living in truth. And the only way we live in truth is through a, a transformation. And transformations I frequently are painful. Okay, so it's, it's going to be a messy six months ahead with lots of things happening. But yeah. you still have optimism that uh, some plan is in place and uh, we'll, we'll get the truth coming out. Uh, at least about the ET and the ancient alien uh, aspect yeah. to this. Yeah. And I, you know, I mean, there are those that will try to exploit that um, for their own political gain. But I, I do think that we're going to start, we're getting a lot of truth right now. A lot of things that we didn't know about 10 or 15 years ago. Like I said, it, I used to be politically, you know, I used to be completely different. Now I'm like, I, I, I'm not taking any sides. My side is our side. You know, let's let's get rid of all these people. And I, I really do think that's what's going to happen. I would not be shocked if if there is not a, especially in the United States and all over the world, a completely new government in a year. And I don't mean because we had an election. I mean, I mean, stuff, people getting arrested, people getting exposed for who they are. I mean, you, you start looking at all the money laundering going through Eastern Europe right now. And I don't want to say the U word. But, you know, that's the most corrupt situation on the planet. And then you've got horrible things that are going on in the Middle East right now. And I, I just, I, I can't see it being anything less than, uh, than chaos. And the question is, will there, be, uh, will there be a new world after we get through it? It's like, it's almost like birth, right? I mean, I, I don't remember being born, none of us do, but it probably wasn't the most fun thing we ever did but when you get out on the other side it's all sunshine and love right so that's that's what i'm hoping for 
Okay, well, uh, so what do you uh, plan to do yourself over the next six months? I mean, any books, any kind of speaking engagements, anything you want to uh, let my audience know? Well, not really. I mean, I'm going to Istanbul in the first quarter, but that's date's not really set. I don't have, really have any speaking gigs set up. Um, honestly, I'm I'm buying food, buying silver, <laughs> buying ammo, um, and just kind of laying low. I'm working with the Y Files folks. That's a great channel on YouTube. If you haven't watched it, they do a great job of taking specific topics in the paranormal and UFO realm and breaking them down for 30 minutes. I've been lucky enough to be writing for them, written about seven or eight episodes, and I'm gonna hopefully be writing some more. And then I'll be doing uh, sort of a video series for um, Zohar Entertainment over in Europe. And um, and I'll be recording some episodes for them and we'll see if they like, uh, if they like the first two or three, we'll see if we'll do some more of those. And that's about it. I'm, I'm not, I don't have a book to write because like I said, I wanna write Ancient Aliens in the Deep State, but I, I don't know how it's going to end. So I'll have to sit back and see how it ends. You have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com. Thank you.